previously on the fan of history. The Assyrian Empire grew silent, the sources, there are no sources, for seven years. And Dido, the queen, fled Tyre to escape its king, Pygmalion. So, this is the events of the 820s BC, part 2. I'm just a fan of history, not an historian. If you find something wrong, please tell me in the comments and I'll try to give you my sources and motivate why I think I think the way that I do. And if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be corrected and learn something new. You should watch some earlier videos. You should especially watch Greece in the early 9th century BC on this YouTube channel. Because this episode will mostly be about the Greeks and about Egypt. So, Europe in the 820s BC. The Villanovans are in Italy. They are not yet the Etruscans. Uh, the Phoenician traders are all over the Mediterranean at this point. They are on the southern side of the Mediterranean, but they're also trading with the Villanovans. And uh, we'll talk about the Greeks separately in this episode. So, Egypt then. Shoshenk III is the pharaoh in the north, in Lower Egypt. He rules from Tanis, he's of the 22nd dynasty. Uh, Egypt is divided and Takilot II rules the south as highest priest of Amun. Shoshenk III will be around for a long while and he might die in 798 BC or 773 BC. Mm, yes, dates are very uncertain for this period, sources are very uncertain. But there will soon be a very good source, but not for dating. So we're still waiting for Pi! Pi, save us from the Egyptian confusion! Well, we're not getting Pi yet, but we might get Osorkon III or Osorkon B, and maybe he can save us. So, Takil, as I said, Takilot II is the pharaoh in the north. This is his titulary on a doorway on the temple of Ptah at Karnak. He's the high priest of Amun, but he's also the pharaoh, because he has declared himself, I am the pharaoh. So maybe we count him as the 23rd dynasty, but the 23rd dynasty seems to be a place where you put everybody who is in the south. Uh, even not. Uh, some people say that Takilot II is of the 22nd dynasty because he re he's related to Shoshenk and he's Libyan. He has a wife, he has several wives as all pharaohs do, but his wife Karuama is the mother of Osokon III. So it's time to meet our man in the field, our voice, Osorkon III. So, he's the son of Takilot II and Karaoma. And this is a statuette of him. He is pushing a bark of Seker. It's from Karnak. His full name actually has an even longer name, but this full name is Usar Matre Setepanamun Osorkon III Siese. He is possibly declared the crown prince of the south and due to succeed Takilot II in 823 BC, possibly earlier. Dates are very uncertain, but this guy is well documented. There is a donation stele, some stone blocks from Heraclopis Magna through to Thebes. But the great thing about this guy is that he has written a chronicle of his life. So he has, we have also Con the Third's own words telling, uh, telling us about his life. And he lived into his 80s. So we know a lot about him. And I don't dare guess how old he is right now, but he's quite young. So in 825 BC, there is a rebellion in Upper Egypt. And remember, Upper Egypt means the south of Egypt. There is a state of insurrection and there are widespread damage to property. The rebels are not identified in any source. And uh, the connection to Pedibast is uncertain. Also, Con the Third as the crown prince overcomes the rebels and take Thebes and the priests in Thebes celebrate his victory. Uh, the captured rebels are executed and burnt. And burning is extra bad for an Egyptian because if you're burned, you will not resurrect. An Egyptian religion is all about resurrection. So you only burn people that you're really, really mad at. And this might be the time that Osokon III becomes the crown prince uh, of Takilot II. 
But in 821 BC, this is, there is even more rebellion, and this is a huge rebellion. Uh, also, Khan III writes about this in his chronicle. It is the 15th year of Taklot II. A storm broke out in this land. The children of rebellion, they stirred up strife amongst the southerners. And there wasn't any omen to warn about this, which was very strange. Remember, also Khan is a priest, and he's due to be the high priest of a moon as well. And also Khan says, I did not weary of the fighting, years elapsed, in which one preyed upon his fellows unimpeded. The cities were in uproar, turmoil in each of them, every person saying, it is I who will seize this land. And we have no idea what Takelot II was doing, he was probably hiding out in that other city. Uh, perhaps he was old, but the fighting goes on, and it goes on for a long, long while. So it's time to meet... The third pharaoh of this episode, and we only have his bronze torso here. It's a very famous piece of Egyptian art, actually. Uh, so he's Pedibast. He appears to be another Libyan. It's good to be a Libyan in the age of the 22nd dynasty. And he might have been the leader of the rebels in 825 BC. And he's definitely a player in the rebellion of 821 BC. They also count him as the 23rd dynasty. And some sources, when they place him as 23rd dynasty, they say that Takelot II is 22nd dynasty. He assigns a competing high priest of a moon at Thebes, and he actually takes Thebes and controls Thebes, and he also controls the western desert oasis, so he seems to have a firmer grip on power in the south than Takelot has. Pai, come and save us please from all of this! But to summarize the Egyptian confusion here, we have three pharaohs, two high priests, and we have one chronicle chronicling crown prince called Osokon III. And Osokon III will be back, as will the others, in future episodes. But first we have to check in with other civilizations of the world. For example, the Olmecs. They are in Mexico. They are doing great things. They have a religious center at La Venta. And uh, the random facts for this week for the Olmecs are that, uh, as you know, they have an elite class, they have luxury items, and they come from far away. For example, they have jade from eastern Guatemala and obsidians from the Guatemalan highlands. So the trade work is huge. And the Maya are around in the Yucatan, and they're living in awe of the mighty Olmecs. In Peru, we have the Chavin. They are peaceful. They are taking drugs, they are having a great time. And the random fact for this week is that uh, they have white granite and black limestone that they build with, and you can't find that in Chavin du Huantar. So they also have a huge trade network, and they also have organized labor in some way. And this is a bit strange because uh, they don't have a ruling class, they have no elite. But everybody is uh, working hard for the gods, uh, or for uh, the drugs, or for something, and they're having a great time in Peru. India, well, oral traditions, Vedic times, we don't know anything, there are no written sources. If anybody knows anything about the powerful kingdom of Panchala, and anything that can be dated, tell me, please. And we don't know anything about the Neo-Assyrian Empire either. That's the first time I've said that for a long time. But something really bad is happening in Assyria, and we'll talk about that in part 3. So, the first Greek colony. During the Bronze Age collapse in the 12th century BC, Achaean Greeks, the native Greeks, fled eastwards. They colonized Ionian cities, including Miletus, which is a very powerful city at this point. Some of them even reached as far as Cyprus, and Cyprus at this point is mostly Greek. But, so those colonies are already there, but I don't count them as colonies, and I will tell you why I call this one the first real colony. It is called Almina, and it is different from all Greek colonies before it and after it. But first we have to talk about the little island. If you look on the map where you see Boelian, you see a huge island, the second biggest island in the Union after Crete. And it's called Euboea. 
there are two very important cities in Jubia at this time. It's Chalcis and Lefkandi. You see on the map, uh, Lefkandi is between Chalcis and Eritrea. And there is no archaeological evidence of Eritrea at this time. So when Eritrea is mentioned, it is probably Lefkandi. And there is a disturbance in Lefkandi in this very decade. A decade. So it's possible that Eritrea starts to be constructed by people from Lefkandi. But the Eubians are sailing all over. They have listened to the Phoenician traders. They have built ships. They are way ahead of uh, the other Greek cities. These two are the most powerful cities in the Greek world. And they will found this colony. The founders of the colony are from both Lefkandi and from Chalcis. So this is Almina. It is uh, on the Orontes River, very close to Karkar, where we had our great battle in 853 BC. It is a trading post and it's a melting pot. Uh, it's, there's trade with Urartu going on to the northeast. There's trade with the Assyrians. Uh, the Phoenicians probably control this. It could also be controlled by Neo-Hittite states. Maybe Patin even. It's a Phoenician style colony for the Phoenicians. It's, it's a Phoenician style Greek colony. So the Greeks do not control the city, but they have Greeks living here trading. It's a trading colony. And I wonder if it's a coincidence that this place is colonized by Greeks right now when the Assyrian Empire is not extending its power to the Mediterranean. But this is where it all begins. This is the source of Western culture even. Because from Almina, Eastern influence will spread over Greece, including the alphabet. The Greeks don't know how to write yet. The Greek alphabet is not around, but the Phoenician alphabet is. And the Greeks living here in Almina, they learn the Phoenician alphabet. They learn the Phoenician way of writing. And as the Phoenicians use an alphabet where one character is one syllable, uh, it is a lot easier to learn to write in Phoenician. Also, the Arameans are learning the Phoenician alphabet right now and writing in Aramean using the Phoenician alphabet. But if we are to talk about the Greeks and the Greek influence in the Near East, we have to talk about the Carians. I didn't know about these guys when I started doing this. I read a lot of history, but I didn't know about the Carians. This is the land of Caria. And the Carians are as close to Greeks as you could possibly get. They, they arrived there before the Greeks and they are around in the Iliad uh, being mentioned as controlling Miletus. Herodotus, uh, the father of history, says they come from Crete, but Herodotus is full of, uh, part of my French, crap. He makes up a lot of stuff. He's very unreliable. But the Carians themselves said they were Anatolian mainlanders related to the Mysians and to the Lycians. Uh, Many references to Greeks made by the Assyrians and the Phoenicians and Egyptians are actually Carians. Uh, they are seafarers, they are very close to Greek culture, possibly even closer to Greek cultures than Macedonians and more well accepted by the Greeks themselves than the Macedonians were. The Hittites refer to the Carians in 1250 BC already and this is a province of the Hittite Empire in 1250 BC. And after the empire falls in the Bronze Age collapse, it becomes a Neo-Hittite kingdom. And when the Greeks arrive from the Bronze Age collapse, uh, Caria loses its west coast, including Miletus. And there is a legend about Miletus where the Greeks killed all the men and married the women. So the people in Miletus are like half Carian. Uh, if you look at this map, there are very many important names here that will later appear. Both Lydia and Phrygia will become powerful kingdom, kingdoms, including such interesting characters as Midas and uh, Croesus. Uh, the Mycians, uh, if you see to the upper left, they are a very violent hill tribe that refuse to live in cities and love beating up Greeks. Uh, I think those are the important things to mention here, but this place will become important. Also note Cilicia, 
to the lower right, to the southeast, because that's how far Shalmaneser got with the Assyrian Empire. But it will be a long while before the Assyrians make an impact on this area again. In 822 BC, King Chuan, trying to be a good ruler, fights the western barbarians, probably the Qian Jun, and another group of barbarians on the Huai River to the southeast. You see the Huai River to the east of the map. Uh, king Chuan is the second last king of the Western Su, and his crown prince is Yu, and Yu has the terrible destiny to be the last king of the Western Su. But remember, the Su dynasty rules China for 800 years, and it's the longest dynasty ruling China in its history. So it's not over, not by a long shot. We have to talk about Babylon before we end this. Marduk Sakir Shumi is the king of Babylon. And remember, he became the king of Babylon with the aid of Shalmaneser III, the king of Assyria. The Kassites and the Chaldeans have defected from the kingdom. The Kassites are ruling Namri, getting beaten up by Assyrians. Or they used to get beaten up by Assyrians, but now the Assyrians are silent. And the Chaldeans are in the south, in the marches, being independent. Uh, Marduk Sakashum is weaker than his father, but he's still in power until 819 BC. And now he notices that something is wrong in Assyria. And maybe now is the time for Babylon to rise to the power of Hammurabi and become the mightiest of nations once again. Next time we will talk about the Assyrian Empire. What is wrong in Assyria? Is the empire about to end? It's been going on since 911 BC and it's been growing stronger and stronger and stronger. But we will look at the twilight years of Shalmaneser III. And who will rule Assyria? Will it be Dian Asher, the powerful Turtanu? He has the control of the royal Assyrian army. But if he takes over, he ends the 1000 year old line of kings. Or will it be the violent prince Asur Daninpal? Or will it be the wiser prince Shamshi Raman? And we will look at maybe the finest Assyrian monument preserved of the empire. The black obelisk of Assyria, a propaganda piece from this time of worries that tell us the story of the reign of Shalmaneser III. I will release this episode on September the 8th. Uh, I do this weekly, uh, I do this decade reports weekly. Please discuss the show with me, subscribe to the YouTube channel, like and share. You can check out the website uh, where we have the podcast, fanofhistorywordpress.com, uh, the Facebook page and Twitter. And any feedback from you is what helps me keep going. Just drop me a line, say good work, and I'll get inspired. Uh, I am pretty inspired, but I can get more inspired. Thank you for watching.